Good afternoon, cybersecurity community, and welcome back to sunny Denver, Colorado. We are here coming to the close of day two of our power packed two days of coverage at MWISE. My name is Savannah Peterson, joined with John Furrier. It's my first MWISE. I gotta say, I'm a super fan now. Yeah, it's, a, it's, a re it's an easy group to uh, get, get along with. Um, the way they think, the security mindset, it really is a lot of you know command and control, frontline defense, but also a lot of deep techs involved. So, Ozzy Grant, this next guest is going to bring a lot of good insights. So I'm excited. I know, uh, Charles. Welcome to the show. We Thanks really so appreciate having you here. You promised us a little bit of story time, which I cannot wait to dig into. <laughs> but before we get there. All of the keynotes have been incredibly inspiring and insightful this, this week, very impressive, honestly, and I frankly don't say that about all the keynotes at every show we go to. Can you give us a little recap of yours? Sure, yeah, so every year I come here and I bring a number of folks that have lived through major security events, whether it's CEOs, CIOs, general counsels, and essentially what I wanted them to do is share their stories. What did they learn about the security event? What are some of the defenses that they've been able to implement after their security event? What are some of the personal, emotional things and challenges that they've had to go through as they dealt with it? And what I think a lot of people don't realize is that these, these events are so intense in so many different ways. There's just so many opportunities for us to learn if we are comfortable and willing to share information with each other. So I'm always so humbled and so happy that people are willing to go on stage with me, especially when they're in the midst of a major security event and a response to that major security event. I was going to say, has to take a certain level of bravery and Absolutely. humility as yeah. well as commitment to the greater good does. Yeah. to get up there and do that. Everybody yeah. that's gone on stage with me is so willing to share their story. They, they, they realize that we will all get better together if we have the opportunity to share what we've learned. And look, sometimes it could be embarrassing, it could be humbling for us. You know, there, there was one year where, where I went on stage in the context of being one of the responders to, to the security event at my own organization. And look, we all want to get better together, yeah. so it's, it's a great opportunity to just kind of share what we learned. On the sophistication side, this is a big topic on this year, um, the evolution of the actors. How is the sophistication of attacks, because we heard ransomware is evolving, reconstituting, the groups are forming, other groups on the infiltration side are, are um, becoming influencers. Yeah. We're, getting, we're seeing a lot of those, and the takedowns are, are higher too. Yeah. We see the FBI just had a report on the botnet uh, came out, so some of these actors are actually being acted on yeah. by law enforcement, so some good trends there, but Talk about the sophistication changes. Are there new, new tools, new technologies? Sure. What are some of the methodologies? Sure, I mean look, there's a lot of things that are similar year over year, and there's obviously things that are new and different, and, and so let me, let me focus on maybe some of the things that are, that are new and different. So, uh, we've seen a lot of targeting of healthcare organizations over the past several months. Uh, threat actors realize that if you target a healthcare organization, if you disrupt their ability to give care to patients, that those organizations feel, you know, pretty compelled to potentially pay an extortion demand because a lot, you know, being able to take care of human lives is obviously, is, is worth a, a certain value. And, and, and unfortunately- It's priceless. Of course, yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Yeah, it, 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 it absolutely is. And, 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 and the, the point is that threat actors realize that healthcare organizations have paid extortion demands. Unfortunately, they had no other option but to do that. And so, unfortunately, they've targeted a number of other healthcare organizations. So that's one of the things that we've seen over the years. We, we've also seen uh, more targeting of individuals directly by way of SIM swapping. So for example, if, um, if somebody goes into a store and pretends to be me and shows fake ID, um, saying that they're actually me, there's a decent chance that somebody at that uh, uh, you know, communication, telecommunication store may provide them with a new iPhone or Android device and port my telephone number over to them. And so that creates an opportunity for threat actors to get access into organizations' environments by taking over somebody's telephone number and then requesting a, a self-service um, password reset from, um, from an, an environment and asking for a one-time password. So, so we've certainly seen that. You mentioned law enforcement actions. I'm always happy when I see law enforcement actions. It's, it's, a, it's an incredible thing that they're able to do. It creates a certain level of recourse and fear and consequences to, to threat actors. So, when threat actors lose money, when they lose infrastructure, when they get arrested, when they get indicted, these are all great actions that help create more fear and consequences to threat actors. And there's always a question about how, how effective are these legal actions and law enforcement actions. The fact is, if there are no law enforcement actions whatsoever, I mean, we'd, you know, crime would be through the roof, right? And so they're certainly stopping a lot of the illegal activity from occurring. 
there's always going to continue to be illegal activity, but we, we, we want to continue to see great law enforcement action to stop it as best as we can. You know, one of the things that's come up on this show is that application security is where Gen AI is fitting into the, yeah. kind of the, the, the paradigm of tra traditional security. How do you see Gen AI evolving in? Is it just another AppSec review? And yeah. is there any new details you can share? Sure, so, so a lot of folks ask, um, you know, what does AI mean to you? And is it better for the adversaries? Is it better for the defenders? And a lot of times we tend to focus on how it's beneficial for the adversaries. And what I'll tell you is, as I think about intrusions, as we respond to about 1,300 security events every year, and we look at how is Gen AI being used by adversaries, for the most part, it's not really being used by adversaries to break into organizations. We see, you know, maybe some research being done. You know, perhaps there's some, you know, um, you know, use of Gen AI to help create better, you know, phishing emails. But for the most part, we're not really seeing a whole lot of malicious um, use of generative AI to you know, attack organizations. I'm also not at all concerned about uh, you know, using Gen AI to create super malware that destroys the world. That's, realistically, that's not going to happen because we've had machine learning, we've had AI for a very long time, and any malicious software that AI creates will probably be detected by the AI and the ML that we had for a very long time from a defender's perspective. So where AI could be beneficial for, from an adversarial perspective, um, and it, it absolutely is beneficial from an adversarial perspective, is around creating disinformation. It's creating synthetic voices, emulating real people. It's creating deep fakes that look like they could be real and they could be authentic. And essentially what it's doing, it's, it's making us question pretty much every video that we see on social media now. We don't know if it's real or not. And a lot of times when I see it, something seems too good to be true, I don't know that it actually is true. So, so that's where, unfortunately, I think yeah. the adversaries have the, the upper hand. It's with disinformation, synthetic voices, you know, deep fakes. At some point in time, I'll tell you that there will be more adversarial use of AI available, but today I would tell you that AI actually benefits defenders more than it benefits the adversary. It will flip at some point, yep. I think, as with you know, pretty much any technology, but right now AI is better for the defenders. Has there been any advances on the data side with Gen AI that you've seen defenders leverage because there's a lot of opportunities in there to kind of maybe help configurations? Yeah. You know. what's, the, what's the outlook on that piece? Yeah. Well, what's cool about Gen AI and uh, cool about these models is you can feed it a tremendous amount of data that might have had it been read and processed by a human being before and how you could get machines to do that and process it, summarize it, help you understand what are the most salient points and data sets, help you identify trends that sometimes are a lot easier for machines to be able to do it than they are for humans. Yeah. And so, yeah, I mean, we, we've been using AI for, for quite some time to help us find trends, patterns, in terms of attacks, and um, help us find you know, vulnerabilities to help you know, resolve those vulnerabilities. Yeah. Well, and, and you're a unique person to be in that position because you've worked on some of the biggest and most high profile cybersecurity attacks that have happened. What have we learned, say, from Solar Winds and Colonial Pipeline that is helping defenders today? Yeah. Well, I don't, there, there are a lot of learnings with respect to I mean, Solar Winds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Perhaps not. You guys were also part of that, too. So we were essentially the first organization to learn about the Solar Winds compromise because, unfortunately, our own organization was compromised. And as we investigated our incident, as we tried to trace back how did the threat actor get into the organization, um, we really struggled to answer that question. And the earliest evidence of attacker activity that we were able to find was weird activity that originated from a SolarWinds Orion system within our own environment. But we couldn't figure out exactly why were we seeing malicious activity from that system. So we had a whole lot of you know, theories and hypotheses. And some of those hypotheses were, was this SolarWinds system sitting out on the internet and we forgot to patch it? And if that was the case, I, I would have felt really, really embarrassed and really you know, upset. Um, another one of the theories or, or hypotheses was, was the system on the internal network, but perhaps there is a zero-day vulnerability in it, and a, um, another company that might have had internal network access to the FireEye network could have you know, potentially exploited that vulnerability. That was one of the hypotheses. And the final hypothesis, which is probably the most radical and crazy hypothesis was, is it possible that the software itself was actually compromised, had malicious content in it, and enabled an adversary to be able to use it to get access to organizations' environments. And that ended up being true. And, and I remember asking the team to reverse engineer a piece of software, which was essentially a legitimate tool, and I know for sure they must have thought, this guy's crazy. Like, he, they're, they're, he's sending me off on a wild goose chase. <laughs> and um, because that was realistically the least likely of all the hypotheses that we were trying to test. But 
we had no other leads to go off of, so we, we had to test it. And it ended up you know, proving to be what, what was the root cause for, for us. So we learned a lot. There were questions around you know, supply chain security. How do, we, you know, how do we trust and verify the software that we use? How do we better compartmentalize our environment? There's just a, a tremendous amount of learning. Well, but. Who was here at this event that shared their stories um, on stage and in sessions that you could talk about? Yeah, so there were three people that were on the stage with me. Um, one person was uh, Christopher Hoff, who's a chief secure technology officer at LastPass. There is uh, Stephen Martin, who's the Chief Information Security Officer of United Health Group. And there's Kimberly Peretti, who's the partner at Alston & Bird that helps a variety of organizations respond to yep. and prepare for security events. And what I really appreciated about the three panelists is that yep. they were willing to share their stories, they share their yep. learnings, and it's so beneficial for the audience to hear what they've learned and what they went through, because it helps them prepare and perhaps maybe avoid some of the you know, mistakes that maybe I've made in the past. Yeah. And that, that's, that's the reason why we should. Nice to see a Q alumni on that list, Chris Hoff. I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. Yeah. Up in the so, all right, all right, yeah, all right, he's good. <laughs> hey, this is instructive, and one of the things that Savannah always talks about is community. Yeah. So having the sharing, and of course, good swag from all the booths behind us, we did a whole segment on that. Um, the, talk about the culture, because the on, on the main keynote yesterday with Kevin, he talked about um, the security mindset, number one, um, and keep elevating cybersecurity in organizations, but just how the culture is changing from the barrage of governance requests and all the paperwork yeah. and bureaucracy that's needed and um, all that heavy lifting and playbooks and processes which is needed with the craft of security. Because, yep. yeah, this is a situational yep. thing, but it's also discipline. Yeah. Yep. Share the cultural so, mindsets. So most of the people that come to this event are, are very security uh, aware. Many of them have dealt with security incidents at their own organizations or other organizations that they work with. So there's, um, I, I think there's more empathy for victim organizations today than there has been in the past. Years ago, 10 years ago, I, I think there was a stigma associated with a cybersecurity event. And yeah, there was a lot of, we're the yeah, we, we, a lot of victims felt like they were penalized, not only by the threat actor that compromised their environment, but, but by media, by external stakeholders, by yeah. customers, because there's a certain sense of, of aggression against victim organizations, and they felt like they were victimized many, many, many times. I think fast forward to today, I think there's a little bit more understanding, um, there's a little bit more awareness for, you know, for, for security events. Maybe not all security events, but but just in general, there's you know a little yeah. bit more understanding for, for what happens. And I think one of the things that's important to know is that a lot of the people that are here at the event, they're the folks that are actively trying to defend their organizations. And it is sometimes a very tiring job constantly trying to defend your organization from a barrage of attacks from a variety of different countries and a variety of different threat actors. And so I think, you know, yeah. the community here is one that uh, wants to share and wants to learn from each other. I think you just brought up a really good point that no one else has said on the stage today, though, is this increased empathy. I think, I think in, it, well, there's, it's understandable there's a knee-jerk response when, when yeah. personal private data is compromised yeah. across the course. course. Totally understand, but to your point, the conversation can get very weaponized if it yeah. makes it look like these top companies are are yeah. are failing to secure or or even not thoughtful. And the yeah. reality is, to your point, that the landscape's changing all the time. Yeah. So I think I think yeah. that was just a really good point, which brings me to a question I'm very curious about. Oh, phrasing this is kind of fun because I don't want to make this sound weird. In terms of cybersecurity leadership right now, what would you say is the DNA of the best cybersecurity leaders that you're interacting yeah. with right now? Yeah, I mean. There's so many attributes that make a successful leader. N number one, you got to have a little bit of technical skill. It's really helpful to have, you know, maybe kind of grown up in a little bit of a technical path, just so you could understand what your team is up against and what they're dealing with. Number two, you got to show a lot of empathy to your team. You got to advocate for your team. Your team has to follow you. They have to be loyal to you, and that's such an important aspect. Number three, you can't get bogged down in the technical details. You got to be able to articulate highly complex technical matters and, 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 and topics to a group of people that don't quite understand cybersecurity, and that's okay, because they're not expected to understand cybersecurity. You as a cybersecurity leader are expected to translate cybersecurity into a language that the average everyday person or average everyday business leader is, is able to understand. Uh, no, number four, um, you got to understand, to some extent, all the disciplines of, of cybersecurity, at least at a high level, 
but you have to have a team of deputies that have the deeper subject matter expertise, and those deputies have to have a team of very competent um, technical, you know, um, yeah. or, or I mean, strategic individuals that could help with the, you know executing executing against a vision and helping to defend organizations. So there's obviously a number of criteria that's required. Is yeah. there is there a playbook around that? Because that came up um, with uh, the former Gardner analyst was on, this, on with us. He said, you can get a new tech stack, yeah. but if you don't get the processes right, right. then you, it's a mismatch. So yeah. they think they're happy. Yeah. IT guys, oh yeah, I got the new, shiny new toy. Yeah. The, the refresh, the foundation, whether it's a refactoring or a complete reset, yeah. you see a lot of that now in the Gen AI movement. Data centers are coming back as um, big GPU clusters, computer yeah. clusters um, to service, I mean, basically supercomputing that's been democratized. Okay, that's an opportunity. So you have, yeah. then you get the threat actors going at the physical layers, you got supply chain yeah. up and down the stack, yeah. all the way to the application. So is there a mindset where in the stack to prioritize, to counter these sophisticated yeah. attacks? Look, there's an infinite amount of threats that you could try to prepare for. And you could go crazy, try to prepare for everything. So you have to understand, you know, as an organization, what are the, what are the most relevant and prevalent threats to an organization like yours, to your sector? And how do you defend against the most likely types of threats um, against your organization? And so focus on the common things. Try not to get too obsessed with the edge cases, because a lot of times we tend to focus on the edge cases, because it's sexy, it's cool. I mean, I just, and we just- Shiny edge yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So you, you really got to focus on that. To your question about you know, technology, look, a lot of companies post-breach end up buying a lot of technology. And they don't quite understand how effective is the technology, how much is it actually helping them. So there's always an aspect of ensuring that you, you have good processes associated with the technology, that you have competent people that are willing to learn the technology, that are willing to follow the processes associated with the technologies and kind of work you know, all together so that you continue to prove that you're actually helping to better defend your organization. And one of the best ways to actually measure the efficacy of all the spend that you put on technology, people, and processes is by conducting a right team exercise. So ask the good actors, you know, whether it's internally um, in employed individuals or a third party security consultancy organization, ask them to try to break into the network and allow them to do whatever they need to do that would enable them to get access to the organization. And don't, don't give them all these rules to make the testing unrealistic so that you get positive results. And positive results to some systems are, you know, yeah. having a, a very capable, capable pen testing organization or right team organization not be able to break in. If I were a CISO, I, don't, I wouldn't want that result. I want a very real world adversarial yeah. attack against my organization so I can identify yeah. the, the blind spots. So I can figure out what processes need to be tightened. So I can figure out how I need to improve certain skills or playbooks on the security operations team. And I want to understand, you know, if I were defending an organization, can I identify an attack? Can I stop an attack? Can I mitigate and eradicate a threat actor from an environment before they have the ability to do something that's really meaningful and impactful? Because I, I don't want to deal with a business disruption. Yeah. I'm not going to be able to stop everybody from clicking on a malicious link or an attachment, but can yeah. I create a layer, layers of defenses to stop yeah. an adversary from compromising one computer to compromising the entire environment? Maybe like Swiss cheese. Yeah. Like if somebody sinks through one little part of the Swiss cheese hole, you're not going to actually make it all the way to the bottom. You, yeah. you, you, you got to have a lot of different layers yeah. of controls in order yeah. to, you know, and, then, really and, then, and then as Kevin said, pull the red lever, sure. yeah. and that's, get, how do I recover? Yeah. So the resilience is a big topic here. Big topic, yeah. How, would, how do you define resilience technically? How does that come yeah. full circle to the IT department yeah. who's got the new stack yeah. that they just, hey, we're going to fresh new stack, but the processes are yeah. there. How do you get that going? So, so I work with a lot of organizations that unfortunately have to pay extortion demands. They, they feel yeah. like they've got no better option. Maybe it's because they have to recover their business operations. Maybe they're concerned about materially sensitive data being published on the internet. There's a variety of reasons why they might do that. But what, what I find now is that the people that pay extortion demands, it's not because they don't have backups. I mean, nowadays, most enterprises have backups and they're doing some level of testing. But there's a number of gotchas. One of the gotchas is, are, is the backup environment available to the threat actor so that they can log in and then destroy the backups? That happens quite often. How often are you actually testing the full restoration of systems? So a lot of times we're not saying, you know, proper enough, you know, full, full restoration testing. Um, a lot of times, most companies have architected backup environments to deal with natural disasters or data center outages or maybe a single server you know, outage. And so if a data center goes offline, then they switch over to another data center because maybe there's a, a hurricane that's coming. But what they sometimes struggle to realize is that when a threat actor breaks into an organization, they're disrupting everything. 
all data centers, all systems, backup systems, you know, primary systems, whatnot. And so you run into a scalability challenge. So you still have backups, but you can only restore so many systems in, in any given day. And so the recovery process may take you know, several weeks or months. And sometimes it takes many months to recover certain systems just simply because you, you, it takes time to get to the last system that you need to restore. And most people never actually fully restore 100% of their environment. They get to 80%, they say, the last 20% is gone. Yeah. And, and I mean, that's just collateral damage sometimes in these, in these yeah. circumstances, and that, that's all right. Okay, last question for you, because the last 20 minutes have flown by. What excites you the most about the cybersecurity landscape right now? Well, You've been in this for a couple decades. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what excites me the most is working with really smart people that are so mission oriented, that want to learn, and will spend you know, dozens of hours or hundreds of hours researching something that's really novel and clever. And in my role, I have the ability to ask a lot of people, um, can you summarize what you've studied over 200 hours, and can you give me a 15 minute update, just so I, it satisfies my curiosity. Um, I'm never gonna know it to the depth that they know it, but it's enough for me to just feel like I, I've learned something. Yeah. And, and what, I learned, what I love about you know, where I work is I, I literally learn, learn something every single day, whether it's from you know, one of our associates that we hired straight from university to somebody that's been doing this for 25 years. I learn something every day from everybody that's around me. If that wasn't an advertisement to get into the cybersecurity industry, I don't know what it is. Charles, thank you so much thank for you. taking the time to be here with thank us so today. Much. It was a here. blast. John, always a joy. We've only got two left. Yes, I know. Well, I wish we had 10 more. Interview. I know. And thank all of you for tuning in to our two full days of coverage here at MWISE in Denver, Colorado. My name's Savannah Peterson. You're watching theCUBE, the leading source for cybersecurity news.